Hello and welcome to Vera Voices. I'm Michael Jacobson, Vera's director, and I'm here with Dr. Faye Taxman, a professor at George Mason University and a well-known national researcher on correctional issues and recidivism reduction. Give me a sense of what, what are the sort of core elements? What, is, what, are, what do institutions have to do to get significant reductions in recidivism? The question really is, <clears throat> are we looking at reductions at the system level or are we looking at reductions at a particular person? So at the person level, we have, you know, a very wide body of literature now that tells us what works. So we know that cognitive behavioral therapies are very effective. We know that addressing substance use disorders, particularly people who are addicts, uh, can be extremely effective. We know that people who have complicated criminal lifestyles would benefit from criminal thinking uh, at types of interventions. And we also know that it's really important how the corrections staff and the probation and parole officers engage with the population as an, an important element to really making the recidivism reduction possible. Let's talk about recidivism reduction in the aggregate now, not at, a, at an individual level, but at a system level. Mm -hmm. If I'm a governor, if I'm a new governor, and my state has an overall recidivism rate of 50%, and I really want to get it down. I, I, my goal is to cut that 50% recidivism rate in half five years from now. What, what do you tell me to do? Well, one thing you should do is you should really Make sure that about 30 to 50 percent of the offender population can participate in effective correctional programming. Right now, one of the reasons we don't see much reduction is we have somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of the population. And there's just not enough people involved in programming to have really an impact. We really need treatment services, and there is no funding stream for this right now, dealing with criminal genic issues, dealing with criminal thinking issues. And that's something we need to develop if we really want to have a long-standing emphasis on reducing recidivism. In general, do most states, if I as the governor say want to do this, do they have the capacity to do it, even if they want to, to deliver effective correctional programming to a significant portion of a number of people in prison? They have the capacity. It's, I think it's more of an issue of do they have the will to really say that the primary mission of corrections is to deter crime in the future. Right now we define the mission as being public safety, but that's fairly amorphous. But if we're really focused on deterring future crime, then we've got a prevention and we've got an intervention model that we can work on. Governors may think they have to hire a new workforce go hire all these PhDs, but that's not really the answer. Really, you've got a workforce that we need to really help them learn to use their people skills better. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, unfortunately in most corrections agencies, probation and parole, not enough of the pre-service or in-service training is devoted to those topics. Right. How important is that connection between the, what happens in the prison and what happens on whether it's either parole or aftercare, but what will undoubtedly be some form of community supervision. Can, can the in-prison treatment just do it, or must you have that in the community as well? You know, aftercare or continuing care is the key to success when you have chronic issues like criminal offending behavior. People don't become criminals overnight. They, you know, it's, you know, it depends on your philosophy about why people, be, you know, engage in that type of behavior. But you can't unravel it overnight. And so we really do need to begin to think about how we develop a continuum of care from prison and jail into the community, into all the different um, settings that people are in. And that's the best way to get long-term results not only for dealing with recidivism, but other social needs that people have, whether it be housing or mental health or substance abuse. I mean, you want to prevent people from relapsing, and the best way is to help them learn what resources are in their community so they don't have to knock on the door of the criminal justice system. Right, so what you're talking about is not just a substantive change, what the correctional system, both community and institutional right. do, <clears throat> but also a cultural change yeah. because the folks that work in those institutions or let's say in parole 
Um, because as you know, a lot of parole agencies are focused mostly on catching people violating, and they'd have to sort of switch from that mm -hmm. um, to a much more treatment-oriented modality and how it seems like a very tall order right now. I think the tall order is not respecting the fact that these are professionals and that they should be given the skills to be a professional and to learn to do their job better. And, you know, I, if, a, if a governor really wants to turn around their correction system, they need to invest in the staff in their state. They also need to expand their social services because, you know, building prisons is um, one thing that people can do. But if you really want to reduce crime, the best way to reduce crime is by expanding services, education, social services in the community. From a researcher's perspective, what are, what are still some of the big gaps you see that just cry, I mean everything cries out for more research, but really the, the gaps in the research that are really important to be filled right now? I would invest in trying to figure out what, how we can engage the 18 to 28 year old person in these sort of evidence-based practices. Um, the average person in most of our treatment in this country is in their mid-30s, which means that we're really missing that period of time when people are heavily engaged in offending activity, the recidivism rates are higher, um, and for whatever reason, that population doesn't really, you know, stick to programs very well. So we need to think about how better to work with that population. That's top on my list. There's so much more research in the field now just about what works, what doesn't work, what might work uh, in terms of recidivism reduction or treatment than there was, say, 20 years ago. I mean, there's been a huge shift. And, and given that body of knowledge uh, in a field that's generally not paid attention uh, on the policy side to evidence. Are you optimistic now, uh, given how much we know and how much research is out there, that the field of corrections will once again start to be driven by research? You know, I think the profession at large would move in the rational decision making. I think the larger issue is, is whether the public will, the politicians, the decision makers, the money people, will actually follow those same principles. And I'd like to see state legislators have to assess whether or not this is an evidence-based practice that they're funding when they actually, you know, come up with their appropriations. Mm -hmm.